reality. It is truth stranger than any fiction the world has known. There is no physical end to the Earth's northern and southern extent. The Earth merges with land areas of the universe about us that exist straight ahead beyond the North Pole and the South Pole. Points of theory. It is now established that we may at once journey into celestial land areas by customary movement on the horizontal from beyond the pole points. It is also known that the fly course from this earth to connecting land area of the universe about us which appears up or out from the earth will always be over land and water and vegetation common to this earth area of the universe whole. Never need we shoot up, as popular misconception demands, to reach celestial land existing under every luminous area we observe at night. On the contrary, we will move straight ahead, and on the same physical level, from either of theory's imaginary polar points. Confirmation of such a fly course is headed that of the U.S. Navy Task Force of February 1947 which penetrated 1,700 miles beyond the North Pole point, and beyond the known Earth. Additional and more recent confirmation was acquired by the flight of a U.S. Navy Air Unit on January 13, 1956, which penetrated 2,300 miles over land beyond the South Pole. There is no space whatever between areas of the created universe, but there must deceptively appear to be space in all observations. That apparent space results from the illusory globularity and isolation of celestial sky areas. The same illusory conditions have been proved to develop from observation of luminous outer sky areas of the terrestrial. Outer sky means the sky as it is observed against stratosphere darkness. The concept that the universe is comprised of globular and isolated bodies originated from the curvature that is developed by all lenses. And that lens developed curvature fosters the deceptive appearance of globular and isolated bodies comprising the universe. The bodies are illusory. The ancient conclusion of Galileo Galilei that luminous celestial areas are isolated from each other and are circling or ellipsing in space was founded on the inescapable errors of lens functioning. The circling movement apparent to Galileo is an illusion. In an endless land and sky universe of reality, the undulating or billowing of luminous sky gas enveloping the entire universe must deceptively appear as a circling or ellipsing movement. The deceptive appearance develops from the fact that such gaseous sky movement is detected by a circular lens. Hence there is necessarily reproduced the circular and therefore globular appearing lens image. Under the mobile sky gas, which extends throughout a celestial realm, there is undetectable but very factual land, water, vegetation, and life like that common to this earth. Therefore, the so-called stars and planets of astronomical designation are in reality lens produced apparently globular and isolated areas of a continuous and unbroken luminous celestial outer sky surface. It envelops every land area of the celestial in the same manner that it envelops the terrestrial land. One may question how such features were known when science was without record of them. If so, one is but to finish reading this chapter, which adequately describes how, when, and where. It was October 1926 when he who sought the answers to the universe mysteries wandered through the woodland vale of old New England, lavish with a scented breath of pine, and birch, and hemlock. There, and as if directed by some unknown force, he viewed a mass wide formation of the celestial sky before it developed the luminosity which deepening twilight shadows would bring. Then it was that extrasensory perceptions force was asserted, and air darkness gripped the woodland scene, the seeker and spirit viewed the vast unknown. Time and space became unknown as the portrait of cosmic reality was unfolded to this inner sight. Unmindful of the deductions and conclusions of the centuries, 
that formidable inner sight penetrated through the luminous sky depth of the resplendent so-called heavens above. Moving beyond the limited horizons of ordinary and standardized perception, he was privileged to witness that which the proud sense of sight had all its telescopic lens assistants regardless of their font of power, had been unable to detect from the time the first crude telescope was fashioned. The sensational portrait developed by extrasensory perception was of the sublime creative universe pattern, which had defied man's analysis from the unknown hour when terrestrial man first beheld the challenging celestial spectacle and it brought realization that the then almost 1,900 year old parable, with eyes ye see not, yet believe what ye see not, should also contain the admonition that lenses patterned after the human lens will be compelled by their function to distort things and conditions, seen and supposed to have been seen, in the universe about us. His perceptions view extended a million miles and more beyond the mathematical boundaries of a fallaciously assumed, isolated globe, Earth. It penetrated through the sublime celestial domain, where deceptive lights, like flashing eyes of artful courtesans, had for untold centuries beckoned and wooed terrestrial man into their enlightening embrace. But terrestrial man, misreading the luminous signals, was denied the long dreamed of pleasure of their propinquity. Had he properly interpreted the signals, he would have long since acquired land areas of the universe about us. There was no misinterpretation of signals by the seeker of 1926. He journeyed to the celestial beacons on the wings of extrasensory perceptions limitless necromancy. That magic permitted breaking through the long-established barriers of deduction, hypothesis, and theory. It disdainfully pushed aside the ice barriers of the terrestrial North Pole and South Pole assumed Earth ends. And there, beyond the poles, the most fascinating creative secrets were divulged. Throughout the ages, they had been held in sacred trust for the doubter and true seeker who ventured that way. The secrets then disclosed provide a knowledge of land courses into all the land areas of the universe. Hence, to discerning consciousness, it was plainly shown there are no ends to the earth. Afflictions curse is always accompanied by a certain measure of blessing. And, alas, each blessing contains an element of curse. Hence dreamers must bear the flagellation which dreams impose rebels must pay a price for their rebellion. They who are driven by forces obscure and extraordinary must be denied mortal contentment. Dreams that have built civilization are magnificent obsessions. But they are nonetheless obsessions. And the obsessed cannot hope to escape the ruthless whipping of obsession. The constant driving urge of one endowed with extraordinary perception demands that the substance of such perception be displayed, defended, and protected, at whatever cost. And he whose unrestrained spirit compelled the breaking of every man-made rule applying to the celestial, was forced to present his astounding findings, and to make them interpretable to the majority. But that majority, accepting and abiding by the conclusions and dictums of established theory, always contentedly dwell within the safety of deductions ordained realm, where finders and findings in the considered abnormal and fearful extrasensory realm are never welcome. Thus how was this pilgrim from the extrasensory world to present his gifts, which were readily perceived to have originated in that fearful realm? How? at a time of midnight's darkness, was one to make plausible the brilliant light of noon to the majority who had never experienced that light. Moreover, the majority had absorbed the century's teachings, which precluded any possibility of that light. That which is original and is conceived beyond the limits of acceptable majority concepts need not disqualify the originator for a workaday existence among the majority, for there need not be abnormality expressed in daily application to demands of the social pattern. Yet the dream, the invention, the discovery, 
or whatever is original is too readily designated as madness. Hence how could the originator of such considered madness hope to woo adherence of the organized and acceptable thing or condition which is an error? Must not the majority always consider the new course revolutionary? And if the thing or condition advanced up since centuries of teachings, must it not be viewed as an expression of one who is mad? The restless creative artist, the absorbed absent-minded inventor, the discoverer, and even the pioneer in an industrial operation may conform to the majority's social framework. But it is always a problem to introduce unwelcome findings to the majority who are absorbed in pleasing, but fanciful and fallacious, traditions which deny the reality of the findings. The enduring pages of history are finely etched with record of dreamer enterprise, which was diametrically opposed to the established concept of a particular time and place. But the dream helped build our civilization, despite majority disdain. It was thus from the time the fool threw black dirt into an open wood fire and, through such foolishness, established the value and purpose of coal. He, and an exclusive battalion of others, represented what the majority was pleased to label crackpots, visionaries, dreamers, and madmen all. But they were the fearless experimenters and pure scientists comprising the always ostracized civilization building clan. Their indomitable spirits were nourished by a creative nectar too potent for normal majority consumption. Such dreamers, forced to dwell in spacious loneliness, were with but rare exception compelled to fight alone. For it is most exceptional for members of the majority to risk their society's censure by open and active cooperation with an impetuous pilgrim from the realm where dreams, so full of reality, are inculcated. The following, therefore, may serve as a timely guide for understanding values contributing towards civilization's development and it may thereby permit easier comprehension of values this work is intended to present in terms that all may grasp. Socrates, the ancient and profound philosopher, was considered mad by the majority of his time and place. And the immortal Christus was denounced as mad on more than one occasion. We may read of the strangeness of Robert Fulton, the harbored an insane idea of harnessing steam for the propulsion of boats. History also records Benjamin Franklin's insane tampering with the elements by catching lightning with his stupid kite in a key. The eccentricity of Thomas Edison is recalled. His particular insane notion was that of holding powerful electricity in a fragile glass bulb to produce electric lighting. Westinghouse had an equally insane idea of stopping a monstrous locomotive and train with nothing more formidable than the release of air. That insanity gave us air brakes. Outstanding in the Dreamers Hall of Fame is the name of Louis Pasteur. He was not a member of the medical fraternity of his time, but he contributed to medical science its most profound values while followers of medical dogma were busy castigating him for such ridiculous enterprise and mad claims. This limited review of the world's so-called eccentrics, crackpots, and impractical visionaries may be continued with mention of Alexander Graham Bell's eccentricity. His plotting perseverance provided our telephone. Telegraphy, too was provided by the madness of Samuel Morse, who was guilty of the wild claim that messages can be sent throughout the world without the sound of a voice. The entry is hardly dry on history's page recording the rights folly. Such a term described the majority's opinion of Orville and Wilbur Wright. Yet while the normal majority ridiculed the new enterprise beyond their understanding, the Wright brothers threw the tradition's restrictions to the winds and navigated the first crew there plane over Kitty Hawk. These and an exclusive list of others who were not popular dreamed their individual dream and made the dream come true. 
and their particular form of compulsion was, to them, both blessing and curse. Therefore, as we are mindful of the unchanging manner whereby life force and work sows perceptions seeds so that mankind may always garner a crop fruitfully original, some guidance should be afforded for future reception of the seeds and the crop. Knowledge should develop that the new and the original of any time must, because of its newness and only for that reason, be decried by constituents of the old. The old, the traditional and established, is always the sacred cow feeding on the clover of assumption in each time's pasture of cultivated and acceptable conceptional values. Therefore, it must be preserved at any cost. The new and unknown is always fearful to the majority. The fears of tending normal pursuits within an established social pattern may be dispelled, or at least modified by one means or another. But the fear of that which is new and unknown, and which is beyond the conditions and afflictions of the ordered pattern, must disturb the conforming majority. Routine is the order of the pattern, and though it is at times fatiguing, it embraces a measure of security symbolic of safety. Hence the new and the unknown must be in some measure resented, and must always fight for a hearing. Human nature demands that beliefs acquired must be cherished and protected, be they ever so incomplete and faulty. My truth is the truth, so say we all. Thus, like the porcupine projecting its quills and sensing possible danger, the majority become automatized to throw against the new and unknown the oral quills of skepticism, cynicism, and ridicule, without even hearing values inherent in them. They fear that the new might encroach upon our ups and cherished beliefs. Accordingly, with some appreciation of guiding principles making for human concepts, we may now review the early movements of this particular work's originator in his pilgrimage to make known the unknown universe of reality. In the summer of 1927 this dreamer's quest led to a widely known arbiter of the mathematical universe, a gentleman benefited with quarters in one of the famous ivy draped buildings of a New England university. After hearing only an introduction to the then unknown conception that in a realistic view of the universe there is no planetary isolation and there are no ends to the earth, the keeper of the mathematical universe vociferously exclaimed, what? Would you have me doubt my senses? Tranquilly came to respond, yes, since it is established that your sense of sight deceives you. That sense in particular should always be subjected to brain sight, where all true seeing is head. The great lens manipulator knew only the mathematical universe, and he presented it as the factual universe. In blindness of rage engendered by fear of the unknown, he shouted, away with you. How dare you tell me there are no celestial spheres, and no space between such conditions? Undisturbed by such reception, the youthful pilgrim departed the university's magnificent halls of yearning and sought other fields for exposition of his perception's extraordinary findings. Shortly thereafter, he was graciously received in the Cardinal's palatial mansion at nearby Brighton, Massachusetts. There, in private audience with his eminence William Cardinal O'Connor, Archbishop of Boston, an impressive word portrait was submitted of the work then known as Physical Continuum. The work was at that time most premature, for there had not been confirmation of its sensational features. Thus, when subsequently afforded press reference, it was described as more daring than anything Jules Verne ever conceived. In that initial 1927 recital, it was shown that the theory of isolating stars and planets is founded on illusion, and it was asserted that every celestial area is definitely attached as the human legs and arms are connected with the torso. It was explained that such physical attachment of celestial areas, and the physical connections of celestial areas with the terrestrial, are always of land, water, or ice, 
it was further disclosed how at that time conquest of the celestial could be accomplished by penetration of land existing beyond the imaginary North Pole and South Pole, or the true geographic centers of the supposedly isolated globe, Earth. Such movement from polar areas was described as leading directly into celestial areas appearing up, or out, from the Earth. That first day's audience with the Cardinal occurred under the burning intensity of an August sun which too ardently embraced the Cardinal's Brighton garden. And the sun's warmth, in conjunction with a dreamer's dynamic recital, soon tired the aged prelate. The audience was adjourned in mid-afternoon. On the following day, the unprecedented recital was continued with a description of what every area of the Earth's outer sky surface would present to observation from stratosphere darkness and from other land areas of the universe. It was explained that the unified terrestrial outer sky surface would be detected as luminous and deceptively globular and isolated areas. Hence the terrestrial sky would present the identical star and planet pattern projected by luminous celestial sky areas. It was then disclosed that the observable luminosity of all celestial areas results from the fact that every celestial area possesses the same sky known to envelop the terrestrial. It was claimed that the Earth's bow sky is luminous when observed against the dark stratosphere by inhabitants of celestial land territory. Hence it is the existence of a blue sky enveloping all celestial areas which permits terrestrial inhabitants to observe that celestial blue sky's gaseous luminosity against stratosphere darkness. In 1927 science was without knowledge that any terrestrial sky area would be luminous when observed from beyond the sky. There had been no stratosphere observation or photography which could have shown the appearance of any terrestrial outer sky area. The first observation and photograph was achieved by the stratosphere explorer, Professor August Picard, in May, 1931. It only approximated a view and photograph of a terrestrial sky area from stratosphere darkness because Picard had not achieved sufficient altitude for a completely dark stratosphere background which would properly express outer sky luminosity. The pilgrim who had explained such a condition as skylight had never journeyed to and within the stratosphere, yet he accurately described all that was to be seen by Picard four years later. And his description contained all that was to be shown by the more detailed photographs procured through a U.S. Air Force stratosphere ascension over the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1935. In addition to records of stratosphere cameras in 1931 and 1935, he described in minute detail that which was photographed by the U.S. Naval Research Bureau's V-2 rocket cameras in October. 1946. Such photographs, procured at an altitude of 65 miles, showed at an oblique angle a deceptively disc like an isolated sky area over White Sands, New Mexico, and subsequent naval research stratosphere photographs at greater altitudes hold most sensational confirmation of physical continuity. Asterisk the unabating heat of the second day's audience at Brighton necessitated early retreat to the cool sanctuary of the Cardinal's mansion, where the recital of endless worlds, and the manner of their conquest, was continued. During those hours the Cardinal's black Scotty was in faithful attendance. He seemed soulfully to absorb the recital's highlights. Perhaps he wondered what a strange tale it was for such environment. The recital described optical illusions resulting from the function of the human eye lens, and it was shown that such an escapable error of the lens had to be reproduced and enlarged upon by all photographic and telescopic lenses, which are patterned after the optic lens. It was explained how lens function demands lens convergence, and how such lens convergence produces the deceptive curvature which, in turn, is developed by the lens at the disc-like proportion reflecting the roundness of all lenses. It was further related 
how lens property and function in that that every telescopically observed area of the celestial deceptively appear to be globular and isolated. It was then rightfully asserted that every area of the Earth's continuous and unbroken outer sky surface would express the identical deceptions when observed and photographed from the proper altitude in stratosphere darkness and from celestial land areas. In other words, all observation of terrestrial outer sky areas from stratosphere depth and from any celestial land area would hold the illusion that the terrestrial territory is comprised of innumerable luminous and grounded bodies, and the illusion of globularity would impose the illusion of isolation. Therefore, if the portrait produced by luminous outer sky areas of the terrestrial would be a replica of that produced by luminous celestial areas, convincing evidence would be had that astronomical observations of the celestial deals with luminous sky gases covering the celestial as they cover the terrestrial. It logically follows that the apparent globularity and isolation of celestial areas is illusion. To use a recent but most inadequate caption by the New York Times, November 5, 1952, the planets are connected. The Times account attributed such a conclusion to the California Institute of Technology. It seems fitting to note here that the author in 1928 expounded the physical continuum in the presence of Dr. Robert Andrews Millikan, then president of the Institute. At Brighton in 1927 the terms, stars, and planets were held to have meaning only for the mathematical universe, which is based on, or developed from, the hypothesis founded on illusion. Conclusions even related negate the existence of astronomy's star and planet entities within the bounds of reality and reason. They have application as isolated entities only to the world of the illusory. Thus the conclusion in a world of reality holds that such assumed entities are lens produced. It is perhaps timely to present a note for readers unfamiliar with the Copernican theory. That theory, postulated in 1543, assumes that the Earth, as an isolated unit in space, rotated daily on an imaginary axis while prescribing a secondary motion in its yearly journey toward and away from the Sun. The theory maintains that other assumed globular and isolated areas of the universe, the so-called planets, likewise revolve in mathematically precise space orbits. The concept of physical continuity, on the other hand, holding that the so-called stars and planets are connected luminous celestial sky areas with underlying land, requires no orbits or paths for assumed isolated areas that are not isolated, and none could be prescribed. Therefore, since such features as planetary isolation and space orbits can have application only to the illusion-based mathematical universe, any stipulation concerning universe limitation applies only to mathematical formula. Accordingly, the earlier and concise academic expression of this work, then referred to as physical continuum and the Janini concept, reasonably opposed abstract mathematical limitations of the universe structure. The physical extent of the realistic universe continues to be indeterminable, despite the sensational results of modern naval research, which brings the universe about us so much closer to our terrestrial area. Any knowableness of the end of anything presupposes knowledge of the beginning and the absurdity of abstract mathematics would be at once detected if the mathematical fraternity were to attempt designation of creation's beginning. Though mathematics may designate a mathematical end without knowledge of the realistic beginning, such an end can hold value only for the abstract universe of the astro-mathematician. It has nothing to do with the structure and the extent of the limitless universe of reality. With today's superior view of universe reality, as acquired through research of the past 30 years, it may be gleaned that Galilean mechanics are no longer required. Their purpose was to fortify the assumptive framework of the Copernican system. The 
laws propounded by Galileo with no consideration for the unknown natural law which governs the realistic universe. They had application only to the artificial universe embraced by the Copernican formula. In the light of modern events, the premise upon which that mathematical and mechanistic universe was erected is proved to be illusory. Hence there can be no further purpose for the mechanics intended to sustain a premise of illusion. In August, 1927, the Cardinal was afforded a mental view of the polar extremities of a supposedly isolated low birth. Then, as the view was extended beyond the imaginary North Pole and South Pole points, he observed how the polarized barriers diminished, and they were replaced with mountain ranges fresh water lakes, and abundant vegetation. As the voyage continued, realization came that the terrain and the prevailing atmospheric density corresponded to conditions at the Cardinal's familiar Brighton estate. In that mental journey on a physical plane with the Earth but beyond the Earth, it was then understood that to reach apparent up areas of the celestial, one need not shoot up or out from terrestrial level, one need only move straight ahead over land continuing beyond the North Pole and South Pole points of theory. The mental tour was directed to land underlying the luminous celestial areas astronomically designated Mars and Jupiter, where the Cardinal viewed startling similarity of the terrestrial and the celestial. From such points the prelate had opportunity to observe the appearance of the approximate terrestrial sky area covering the Brighton estate. Looking up through the inner blue sky enveloping Mars and Jupiter, the Cardinal shockingly beheld against stratosphere darkness countless luminous and seemingly isolated disk-like areas. They were known to be areas of the terrestrial sky, but they presented a positive duplicate of the so-called heavens above as observed from terrestrial land areas. It was then realized that up is at every angle of observation from the terrestrial and the celestial. Hence up is everywhere, and it is always relative to the particular position occupied in the universe whole. Accordingly, the heavens above are everywhere. As twilight threw soft shadows over the Cardinal's Brighton estate as we returned from the extraordinary celestial journey and the second day's audience was terminated. That journey had shown the Cardinal what Galileo could not have hoped to show Cardinals of his time. Galileo had been restricted to a description of only that which the illusion-producing lens of his construction could detect. That lens was impotent to detect cosmic reality, and its successors are also impotent to detect cosmic reality. The illustrious Cardinal realized the import of what had been shown. As his guest prepared to depart, he remarked, If it is so, the world will know of it. As the departing guest slowly trod the garden walk, where seeds of truth had been sown, the Cardinal's black Scotty scampered over the green. Some of the seeds of that day's planting at Brighton were to sprout within four years, through the original stratosphere ascension of August Picard. Others required eight and twenty years, respectively, through the U.S. Army Air Corps stratosphere ascension of 1935 and the U.S. Naval Research Bureau's V-2 rocket flight of 1946, Contrary to popular belief, no explorer had penetrated beyond either pole point prior to 1928. Press captions of the years have confusingly conveyed the idea that Arctic and Antarctic flights have been over the pole and therefore over the end of the Earth. Such has never been the case. Over the pole point is possible, for there is such a mathematical point but over the end of the Earth is not possible, for there is no end. Certain early explorers reached the pole points, but to return they were obliged to retrace their course to the pole point, 
In other words, they had to turn around. They did not go over the pole in the manner implied by press accounts. It is the globe symbol which conveys the false idea for press and public that movement over the pole from one side of the earth to the other side is possible. That symbol does not attest the realistic extent of the earth or the earth's factual relation to the universe whole. It is simply a convenience of archaic theory, it was never anything else. Trips from Alaska to Spitsbergen, and vice versa, represent movement only in the west to east and east to west direction. There were never journeys due north from the Arctic Circle to and over the pole. No explorer has ever moved over the pole point, north or south, and arrived on the other side of the earth in the manner indicated by the globe symbol. If movement could be made over the pole and it were possible to return to the starting point on the opposite side of a supposedly isolated globe, Earth, there could be no possibility of going beyond the pole, Earth, as has been accomplished since 1928. No beyond could exist, unless it were the originally conjectured space. The formidable factor prohibiting airplane flight, or other movement, in a northerly direction from one side of the North Pole area, and arriving on the opposite side, as the globe symbol indicates, is that endless land extending beyond the pole point. That land, unknown to the theorists of 1543, is the land this author's treatise described as early as 1927. And it is the land beyond which we are Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd, Hughes, M, and a naval task force penetrated in February, 1947. That identical factor of land beyond applies as a prohibiting agent to any southerly movement over the South Pole, which would permit return on the northerly course to other areas of the mathematically prescribed globe, Earth. All movement north from the North Pole and south from the South Pole must of physical necessity led beyond the Earth's northern and southern mathematical boundaries. And it leads directly away from and beyond the conjecture, globe, Earth. It should be remembered that the so-called northern and southern ends of the Earth were only assumed. They were never factually determined. Further, the assumptive value was imposed more than 400 years ago, at a time when restrictions on polar explorations prohibited determination of factual terrestrial extent. It should also be held in mind that the Earth cannot be circumnavigated north and south within the meaning of circumnavigate. However, certain around the world flights have contributed to popular misconception that the Earth has been circumnavigated north and south. Over the North Pole, with return to north temperate zone areas without turning around, can never be accomplished, because there is no northern end to the Earth. The same conditions hold true for the South Pole. All progressive movement beyond the respective pole points leads beyond the assumed ends of an isolated globe, Earth. And that area beyond constitutes a land connection with the celestial. That connecting land, though appearing up or out from terrestrial points other than the poles, is attainable by movement straight ahead from the imaginary pole points. This is not 1927. The existence of worlds beyond the poles has been confirmed by U.S. naval exploration during the 30 years since then. The confirmation is most substantial, though information has not been divulged from every rostrum. They of the rostrums are as little informed of the meaning of polar exploration as members of the press. That is why this book is duty for me but most arduously written. 